three, Scaro! Hello, everyone. Welcome to Radio Free Scarrow, episode number 846. I am Stephen in Edmonton. Born in Vancouver. And Chris in Edmonton. On this uh, episode of the podcast today, we have episode three of our classic series commentary of Planet of Evil. But uh, uh, the big news, the giant news, at long last, we finally have a trailer for new Doctor Who revealing... That Matt Barry is the doctor. Amazing. <laughs> Isn't, oh, glorious. We, we, of course, is, we'll, we'll talk about Legend of the Sea Devils, but because it was April Fool's Day, the listen, I saw this on the morning of April Fool's Day and then said, we're done. We're done. I, 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 April Fool's Day has mostly uh, been dead and buried since uh, the, the, the crap year that was 2016. Uh, but then Rob Ritchie, who, of course, has been animating stuff for Doctor Who, uh, uh, DVDs and Blu-rays for for several years now. Uh, put out his <laughs> amazing parody of a Matt Berry, um, it's who of brilliant. course and plays profane Steven, as hell. Profane as hell. So we cannot quote anything from it. Uh, um, a, a, a mock-up of Matt Berry as as Stephen Toast as Doctor Who. It's great. It 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 took yes. over the internet. Uh, we have to mention here. So yeah, it, links in the show it got a lot of like uh, saw like slash film and I saw some. Uh, sites that I wouldn't necessarily expect to run or, uh, yeah. things on uh, Doctor well, Who. Yeah. Carry, yeah. Yeah. Carry yeah. A story I'd like it. to I'd like to quote editor Scott Simmons, who I had the pleasure of meeting at NAB. He refers to that kind of site as churnalism, and that is exactly what that is. <laughs> I love oh, a that. thing people like. <laughs> Let's churn it out. Yeah. So that's that's churnalism, which doesn't take away from the original thing being great. It just means, of course, a ton of sites covered it because it's in front of them, and they'll put it out there for clicks. Mm-hmm. Well, it was worthy of clicks uh, and worthy of praise. Yes, it was. I watched it, it like was. three times before we uh, we re- recorded it. So, <laughs> Same here. Yeah. It was great. Uh, so links to the show notes if you want to watch that. It's superb. Uh, well done, Rob Ritchie. Uh, as he, ha- he has a regular day job uh, doing Doctor Who stuff. He was doing more or less in his spare time. But seriously, BBC, when you get back to animating uh, Doctor Who uh, missing episodes again, uh, hire that man because he is superb. Um, <laughs> what did also, he, what the, did he the, say? I can't remember the name of the actor. Oh, Sorry, Ben I, Kearns. Yes, ben Kearns, a voice actor who does a bang on Matt Berry. So much so that, that I thought when I was watching that, did Matt Berry actually agree to do this? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I understand that he's not as active on social media as Mr. Barry, uh, and, but I do hope that uh, somehow that reached uh, his eyes and ears to see because it was a loving tribute for <laughs> Right. Although every time I see his name on Twitter, which is Porksmith, I always laugh. That's a great name. <laughs> great. Yeah. So you were saying, Chris, uh, about Oh, something. I just uh, didn't, what, what did Rob Ritchie say? This is what happens when I'm bored or something? <laughs> yeah, oh, talent. That's what happens when you're bored. Thinking, oh, man, that yeah. must be nice. I wish I had that level of crea- creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, and, and the bigger news, of course, uh, the BBC listening to our last episode and uh, and me go on about how there was no promotion whatsoever for the upcoming Doctor Who episode in, in a little under two weeks, uh, furiously and uh, and hurriedly rushed together a, uh, an, an image and a, and a release date, which is cool, actually, a little black flag uh, with a sea devil on it, uh, with April 17th being the... Um, uh, the broadcast day, still no time, still no time. Uh, and then on Saturday, on Saturday, the second, uh, you know, typical, because uh, <laughs> Saturday apparently is the time to drop trailers. Uh, there's a trailer, the first trailer for Legend of the Sea Devils, purely. So all of this, the BBC marketing push, purely in response to um, uh, this podcast uh, pushing <laughs> of the BBC to do that. Uh, yeah, it's got uh, nothing to do with the fact that the no. deadline to file... No. <laughs> um, information with with uh, TV um, <sighs> schedule yeah. publishers nope. is about two weeks in advance. Nope, none of that. <laughs> nope, absolutely not. None of that. 
yeah. Anyway, I, yeah, he I, says having looked at the CTV sci-fi <laughs> schedule for the seventeenth, and all they have is the Mummy and the Mummy Returns mid afternoon that day. It's terrible. Good work, CTV sci-fi. <laughs> on top of things, as always. I mean, I yeah yeah. I mean, okay, yes. I I like the trailer. I am looking forward to this. I love uh, Doctor Who's outfit. I like all the outfits. I love that there are sea devils in there. They look pretty cool. Um, You're I, totally I, gonna cosplay Dan in this frilly shirt. <laughs> yeah, Dan's frilly shirt rules. Frilly shirt is fun. Uh, but yeah, I am still annoyed that uh, a we don't have a broadcast time for episode that airs in less than two weeks now. Uh, there's nothing on the there's no no information that, whatsoever. That, that, can't, that can't be more than a couple of days away. I'm sure. Oh, probably. But I mean, as as I'm looking at, I mean, this is I'm just I'm beating this drum every week because it's it there's 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 they keep giving me drumsticks to use to beat said drum. Um, <laughs> and you are a drummer at the end of the and day. And I am so. a drummer, and it's you know I'm 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 not I'm. I mean, I, I never watched season two of Discovery, so I never latched on to the Strange New Worlds crew, but there's that new Star Trek show, Strange New Worlds, coming out on May 5th. And like every day this month, they seem to be, uh, you know, having this Twitter thing about introducing a new character for that show. And it's like, mm-hmm. this this must be nice to be able to be in control of your own entity that you can say months down the road, it's coming March, uh, May 5th, <laughs> and here we can promote it. Where, as opposed to the BBC, which has to wait until oh, TV listings, what's ITV sure. going to do? You know, they have to be cagey. And so they never, they never promote their shows until to, to be the last fair, minute. They're also trying to build an audience for things like Strange New Worlds, whereas Doctor Who has its established audience. Well, maybe well, you sort of Star Trek in a way. Yeah, I mean, they do. Yeah. But also, uh, to be fair, American TV and film and just the entertainment complex is generally better at self-promotion than the British one is. Yeah, it is. It is, to be honest. Mm-hmm. A little more competition as well, wouldn't there be? Oh, I just It's just, well, it's more of a business. Well, I say that's really reducing it. But, it's, yeah. but it's, America is purely commercial, so, I, it, so yeah. It is It is weird because, you know, it's it, the, the promotion of Doctor Who stems from the British angle and then whoever is airing it elsewhere has to sort of like, you know, follow their lead. And so mm-hmm. BBC America, or, you know. Or <laughs> to go a step beyond that, back in the like 10 years ago kind of time frame, um, space... Space didn't. Space didn't follow the BBC's lead. They followed BBC America's lead. Yeah. So, oh, like Even series less. series six, for example, when it was was Memorial Day, uh, BBC yeah. America decided to skip showing Doctor Who that day and push it back a week. And yeah. space space was told you got to do the same thing. Yep. Uh, and, and so this is and so basically B, the BBC is is their their only competition in their eyes is like ITV, uh, whereas really what the Doctor Who's competition is Strange New Worlds, is and everything else. Moon Knight, yeah. is everything other, every other genre program yeah. that everyone else is already watching or wanting to watch. And, you know, and Doctor Who is just sort of like, oh, you know, a less than two weeks before the episode airs. Oh, by the way, here's this episode coming up. It's the last one for six months. Like, you know, it's, uh, did you, yeah. Did you get a chance to look at uh, BBC America Press? Uh... Oh no, there's nothing there. There's nothing Stuff, there. Nothing there's there. been nothing on the BBC America there's, there's, press there's, site. There's nothing on the CTV side of things. No. Uh, like the Flux is the newest stuff they have. Yeah. Uh, okay, in, in fact, the, come on, the, CTV. The like, BBC not, not Ameri- even the Alex Flux. The B- no, the BBC America website, uh, press website, says uh, f- uh, re- Doctor Who returns October 31st, and there's some there's some uh, basic images for Doctor Who Flux, but no individual episode images, Jeez. nothing for Eve of the Daleks, no press releases, and nothing. This is why I think this is why I'm, I'm led to believe the BBC America just like yeah, we're done, we're done with okay. this, we're done. Uh, they're just going to write, out, write destroying- out the contract. Yeah. yeah. At the risk of destroying this negativity, can I talk about two things I like about this Yeah, we'll trailer. talk. Yeah, we'll actually One, talk about the trailer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One is that, um, okay, it's Legend of the Sea Devils as a title, but we only up to now saw the one Sea Devil, so yeah. it was very nice to see a whole pack of those dudes. True, yep. Um, but the other thing I like is that they have, the voice is slightly modernized, but still close enough. Like, it's, it is the <laughs> for, Sea Devil's voice, but if you use the original one, you'd be there for three days. Like, for the, for the four just, words we get from a Sea Devil in the trailer. Yeah. yeah, but it seems like they sped it up without sounding too much like they sped it up. There's lots, I mean. Yeah, there's a lot of sibilance like there was with the... Yeah, yeah I, I, I feel like, hey, you're right, Warren, because I think there would be... Yeah. Oh, it would take forever. And also, yeah. you know, with today's modern uh, sound mix on TV, I feel like this would get buried in the mix. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because yes. doc- Doctor Who has never been accused it's, of having this do- sound mix as a music no. drown out speech. <laughs> Doctor Who is never quite well, the old these one, days. You just, you just have nothing but monaural. <laughs> so you could do it. But. Yeah. 
So, the, you know, yes, it's. I, I, I'm sure that you could probably, maybe they even will explain this in the show. Oh, they sound slightly different than when I last saw them 35 years ago or something. Uh, you know, maybe it's because this is a different, this is a different sort of branch of sea devils, which is what, you know, what I kind of like about, about the <laughs> I history. I just want to hear them say, Metapelis. <laughs> just, just to cause trouble. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I like that, uh, you know, may, maybe because they are a different sect of sea devils, they're wearing clothes. For one thing, as opposed to just sort of mesh jumpers or whatever the hell they were doing in the Sea Devils or samurai and outfits different and warriors. Yeah. Maybe they just uh, got lazy over the years in, in the 1800s. Their vocal they were cords all... haven't had as much stress. Exactly. That's what earlier. I think. Yeah. Maybe they've been so used to being above the surface that they, they don't, they've adapted and they, then they they don't have to sort of speak through gills or something like that. I don't know what now they, they do it, but uh, maybe so they may, just got maybe tired of dry cool. cleaning all the cool clothes and went to mesh because it's easier. <laughs> Here's Maybe here's what the, here's what the show's not going to do. Explain any of that. No, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> Why would it? Well, would it though? You never know. Nerds, nerds run Doctor Who. No, no, that's that's a Strange New Worlds thing. An entire episode. Si- Silurians things. were completely naked, and they were <laughs> in old Doctor. At least the Sea hey, Devils had the samurai the world, stuff. And if, in, if uh, you warriors. used to run the world, yeah. you'd be like, you know what? I'm not wearing clothes. You can go to hell. <laughs> I'm a Silurian. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, our our lack of clothes at Doctor Who and the Silurians is a statement. Apes. Now, having said that, yeah. um, the modern Silurians do wear clothes, so there is that. that that's where I was going with that, yeah, because yeah. everything got revamped for the, the modern Silurians, so why not do the same for the Sea Devils? Yeah. Because Even though, yes, know. the Sea Devils yeah. did wear clothing back in back in the day. Yeah. Well, they just look cool in these new outfits. Yeah. Uh, I love ships. Uh, I love stories set on ships. I hope uh, this is a, a, a the best story set on ships, <laughs> because Curse of the Black Spot and the Smugglers. I mean, the Highlanders. The Highlanders the bar, is okay. There's a bit on ships. The bar's low for for uh, shows on ships, but they shot it in uh, um, in like just off. I was, I was reading the Doctor Who magazine preview, uh, and they they shot it uh, off the coast. Like a lot of that stuff is actually on location. I don't know what I can't remember if they actually built a boat or had a big boat, but the, you know a lot of the actual sets are are probably in the studio and stuff. But um, it looks kind of cool. Chris, did you uh, did you have any any thoughts uh, things that you liked about the the, the trailer that you want to mention here? I don't think so. Nothing that has, hasn't already been said. Mm. Um, I, I, I do love Jody's outfit. I love I, I, Yaz too. It is a great outfit. Yeah. All of them. It's, but, but especially, especially. Well, Dan's being dressed up as a really joke special, probably. Yeah. That, But I, I, I mean, I was... Uh, in series 11, Jody's first season when, you know, they were just running around in their, their modern clothes in various period uh, yeah. settings. Well, and I thought those those would, were your bugbears with like, uh, it was, Village yeah. Diodati, for example, or they got, whatever. they, yeah, they finally got there in Villa Diodati, except for the doctor. She was wearing her no more outfit, which is fine. But yeah. now they're all in. And I just thought like that, that it looks great. Ray Holman did great work on his, on his bit of uh, like, this is it. He's, 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 he's left Doctor Who, uh, after this. So like, you know, th- this is the weird bit too, where if you read the Doctor Who magazine, uh, preview, you know, there's Chris Chibnall's a bit there, but Jodie Whittaker's not there. Bandit Gill's not there. John Fisher's not there because they're all gone. They're all gone. We're we're in that weird handover time in between eras of Doctor Who, where the people who have made the the outgoing era have left. Jodie Jodie well, Mando- Whittaker is like six months pregnant. I mean, she's not yeah. interested in doing promotion for this stuff. You know, Man- Amanda Gill's doing a play in London. Right is she now. doing a play in London? I didn't know that. Yeah, it, oh, what the heck is it called? Murder Two Twenty Two or something? Right. Yeah, I'm gonna look it up here. All right. Um, so it, it, we're in this weird bit where where it's uh, you know this this is where you need perhaps the the broadcaster and or maker of the show to sort of like maybe uh, pull pull a little more weight in order to promote the show when you don't have your stars available to do it. But anyway, I mean, much as uh, I'm dreading certain possible aspects of the RTD two era, right. that will not be one of them. He will promote the living crap out of whatever it is. It will be very much promoted, especially with the uh, the outside promotion agency that they've. Uh, they have hired to do that aspect of things, but um, but it's called, uh, it's called yes. two twenty two a ghost story with Mend Up Gill. There's a prior cast, and they've done a whole changeover. Mend Up Gill is now part of the cast, as is Tom Felton from uh, that needs Draco, Draco Malfoy fame. Oh, that's that guy. That's right. Um, so anyway, Legends of Sea Devils uh, airing on April seventeenth, that being Easter Sunday on BBC One, BBC America, CTV Sci Fi, April eighteenth. At several seven thirty p.m. in Australia, and then that morning earlier on on iView as they've as they've done for the past while. That morning is like early that morning, like basically yeah. when it, when it's done airing on BBC, then 
iview has it straight yeah. after some such yeah uh i don't know where it's airing in new zealand but it's, it's airing also on on april 18th tv too, NZ, but, um, i'm assuming but probably uh it's normal home for such things uh so um the the important news of course is that we'll be doing a live stream uh r- recording for a review of that time tbd it'll be mm-hmm. in the evening here in the mountain zone of time and the pacific zone of time um so probably those in the uk probably won't have a chance to it uh to to pop in unless you're insomniacs or getting up super early but uh australia and north america we got you covered so um, but we'll, um, we'll tweet that out in, in two weeks time yeah. when we have a new We're, episode of Dr. When Weird we know Watch. more, you'll know more. Yeah. Which we don't right now. We don't know. And you already know more when we know I mean, more. If, <laughs> I think it's a very safe bet that 7 PM is, is going to be the broadcast time on BBC one because that's kind of what it has been. But it doesn't make it fact just because you know. seven p.m. on BBC One. I don't know about that. I mean, what time's Country File airing? Let's find out when that is and sort of work backwards. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm most intrigued about what that next time trailer is going to look like after Legend of the Sea Devils. Like, what yeah. are they going to be doing yeah. there? Or will it just be Jody regenerating? Just the regenergy flying off, and I, that's all you see. I uh-huh. can see the trailer teaser, whatever, ending with like. You know, oh, the last shot, I guarantee. It's going to be her gonna be starting that. to regenerate or something. Yep. Yeah, you'll yeah. just hear the music or like the sound and then a bit of regenerate and then then cut to black. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I am intrigued to see what happens in this. Given that, you know, uh, if you read the Doctor Who magazine preview 576, uh, they, Chris Chibnall mentions that this was basically an idea they had for Flux, but couldn't work it into Flux. So maybe like originally, mm. like for the original season, uh, series 13. And so they, they reworked it into a, a standalone special. Which um, given some of the avenues they took and explored in Flux, that's, wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with that because that means my boys get a full episode of themselves. Well, yeah, true. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, uh, I was always so interesting that Ella Road, the co-writer, was saying that, uh, yeah, we, it's, it doesn't, you know, yeah, Thasman doesn't form a big part of this. But also, but it's it's certainly there. So it's kind of like, hmm. Which means there's like mm-hmm. one episode left for them to actually explore that if they're going to. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also is that you know uh, this isn't I don't think this is mentioned in the Doctor Who magazine preview, but you know this was sort of kind of going to be the last episode, and then the BBC said, "Hey, could you do one more for the hundredth anniversary of the BBC in October?" Yeah. So I'm wondering how regener the in- imminent regeneration will play into this as well. That's what I'm curious to see. We'll find Watch out. Watch the space. Yeah, in two weeks' time. In or two- indeed that space, not this one. One no. um one thing with this is so back in the in the Tenant era, I was not a David Tennant fan. What? Um, this is news. It, yeah, wow, shocking. Hey. Chris was uh, angrier until, angrier back at back in those days, as I recall. But anyway. Yes, I was. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, uh it wasn't until Waters of Mars, the penultimate story. Where I finally am like, okay, I can I can buy this character as the Doctor. <laughs> and so, wow! And, and what followed is the worst episode of Doctor Who of all time. Trash. Yeah. But, yeah. but but I would like to sing the praise of Waters of Mars because it's still to this day great. It's, it's so fantastic. Good. So good. But the point being, if that's what it took for me, then maybe we'll get some some of the the uh, you know the old hashtag not my Doctor folks <laughs> on naysayers. board with, on board with Whitaker's Doctor with. Uh, Something like this. I think you hope too much for those yeah. idiots. Let's not miss words here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the penultimate uh, episode for Matt Smith was the Day of the Doctor. <laughs> I wonder if there are any doubters for him uh, until they saw that. So, you know what? It's, it's, it's Doctor Smith Who guy. fandom. I guarantee there are. There are probably Hartnell doubters out and there. Yeah. To, to front load stuff from the time lash, today, as we record on Sunday, the 3rd of April, uh-huh. is the 12th anniversary of uh, 12 uh, 11th years. Hour. 12 years. By yeah. the way, I'm a Cushing uh, doubter. Of course you are. Oh, there's crushing news uh, in Doctor Who magazine as well. As I just jump right, jump right ahead to that, Doctor Who magazine uh, had Is it some. The book inf- we talked about last week. No, it's a, it's the a Cushing movies. They're, they're coming to the BFI in what June or something like that. But the 4K oh. Blu-ray release is coming uh, later on this oh, nice. year. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Shenanigans and tomfoolery and glorious. I know. 4K. Well, I I don't know if it's the same. I mean, the extras, the commentary with um, Mark Gatiss, uh Kim Robinson, and Rob Sherman is mentioned, but that, that was on the Kino Lorber, uh, Blu-ray that came out last year or two years ago. I can't remember now, but the, it's the ones I have. I don't know if, I don't think, uh, those are the 4k ones, but it doesn't matter because I'm, 
I'm not as fussed about 4K, but yeah, the coming out is 4K. What, Blu-ray, what I so. love about the second movie is that they take the Dalek invasion of Earth, which is decidedly not wacky, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they wacky it up, and somehow it really works. I don't know how they pulled it off. Uh, well, th- well, during Bernard Cribbin scenes, certainly was well, yeah, wacky. Uh, the uh, the pill eating scene, yeah. Anyway, all that and more in Doctor Who Magazine 576. Uh, we mentioned Matt Berry. A- a- oh, anything left on the trailer? Uh, Legend of the Sea Devils you want to mention before we move on? I mean, it is an actual new... I mean, it's a minute. There's not much to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The ship with the glowing thingies at the bottom looks pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Madam Ching, uh, all that history. I have to admit, I don't know much about Madam Ching, so I, I, I went and looked on Wikipedia and read on how she like was this pirate captain who was in command of like 1,500 ships and like 60,000 pirates or something like that. Like what? Like it's that, all... is, that is very difficult in the era before anything besides a letter. Yeah. <laughs> and semaphore, uh, I was guess. Like the, yeah. Whatever, whatever the Chinese equivalent of semaphore was at the time. Yeah. It was in the 1800s. For some reason, I thought, you know, the, the golden age of Caribbean piracy was like sort of the 16, 1700s, but uh, 1800s in China. So I'm, I'm learning something. <laughs> I like how the golden age, as if it was a pleasant time no, for No, well, that's what this they were- piracy that, we're talking about they, here. That's what they called it. I'm just saying that's what they call that it's not me calling it that um i know i know your traditional your traditional pirates of the caribbean-esque pirates you know there we go those yeah. cats the one that dan is basically dressed as in uh, in in this episode but um uh yes uh looking forward to that two weeks hence legend of the sea devils um this weekend was wales comic-con where there were several doctors who in attendance uh uh, Colin Baker was there. Um, Peter Davison McCoy McCoy was there. Peter Davison, David Tennant was there as well. Um, and Georgia Tennant posted a great photo of Peter Davison at the uh, at the at the, <laughs> at the be- end of a long, long line to meet David Tennant with a big side that says he's not that special. <laughs> that is great. Peter Davison remains... Trolling the son-in-law. I mean, it's his job anyway. uh, Just because they're both doctors, that's kind of incidental, the fact that he's, you know, ragging on his son-in-law. What the hell? Why wouldn't you? He's so good. I think I've called uh, Peter Davison... I might have even said this to his face. Uh, He is... He's like the Jimmy Carter of of doctors. He's the the best past doctor, you know? Like, Jimmy Baker still holds up his end pretty well. Yeah, Yeah. Jimmy Carter, like, you know, builds, uh, you know, Houses for Humanity and all that stuff and just did great work into his 90s uh, and and Peter Davison just just never fails to entertain me um, with his uh, his post-hoo shenanigans. Colin Baker has not played himself on Toast of London, so there's that. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. Uh, Anyway, he's great. Uh, Also, um, uh, just looking ahead of the news list, this is going to be a wild swing, but we'll start with this. Gallifrey One 2023 tickets are on sale. They dropped on the the evening of uh, April 1st. Uh, They're still uh, still available. Uh, They don't expect it to sell out in, in, in minutes. So, but you know, get, get your, get your, get your hands on your tickets. Uh, We, yeah. I want to personally talk to COVID here and say, you better back off, sir, (laughs) on this one. By 2023, you better be a common cold or else. Uh, Yep. I agree, because, uh, yeah, uh, we bought tickets. Uh, you got tickets. We all have tickets here yep. for California mm-hmm. One. I'm yep. crossing my fingers and hoping that this human, humans, uh, humanity's stupid decade that's a little less stupid by next year. Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, you know, things don't ever um, gear down as fast as we'd like them to, uh, but the, the lack of a new variant um, is, is well, hopeful right now. I mean, it hasn't happened yet. It still might. It still might, you know, but it's... Um, I'm going to, but okay. Yeah, um, I, I know that, that Europe had a had a blip when it came to the uh, BA two Omicron subvariant, but uh, that is sort of starting to subside in places, which is nice. So we'll we'll see how this goes. I I mean I there have been a lot of people I know who have had it uh, and mm-hmm. have sort of gotten which over. wasn't the case up until a couple months ago. No, and 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 you know, triple vaccinations have have are greatly reduced the impact of that. Uh, but we'll see how that goes in the future. But yeah. It's 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 looking it's looking better than it was. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Cross fingers. That's yeah. all I got. Cross to fingers. A, to a point. Like we're we've we've got plans to go to the UK in the summer in in, in July. Right. And uh, of course, a couple of days ago, all the newspaper headlines in the UK are like uh, you know highest number of infections ever. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so. BA yeah, we'll BA see. two is 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 very much having its way with the UK these days. So. A little bit. I'm, long before I worry about Galley, I'm worried about other, <laughs> other places because they'll, they'll have an impact on me. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
That's true. Anyway, I got for one ticket, so on sale. Live in hope, everyone. Uh, and buy your tickets. If if anything, you're helping to support uh, the convention <laughs> according, as well. So. According to Time Hop, uh, this time last year, today last year was when I got my first first COVID vaccination. First, dose, so. look at that. You've had two cents. So I nicely done. Had two yep. cents, and the world is still being stupid. So I mean, <laughs> okay, well. not till the end of the month for me. A post Legend of the Sea Devils anniversary for me would be my first vaccine. <laughs> my, yeah, I don't. One one thing I'm so with the with the U.S. at least for people over fifty saying, "Yep, go get a, a fourth shot." Um, hoping that by by, the time by July, I the, by the yeah. time I go to the U.K. in the summer, uh, the fourth fourth shot will have uh, come and gone for me. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, as 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 effective as Wayne's, but. Uh... We shall see. Uh, let's talk about Noel Clark. Unfortunately, uh, the Noel Clark harassment allegations, uh, re- according to Variety and several other places, will not be investigated by the London Metropolitan Police. This is, a, this is of course, happened last year around this time uh, where several dozens of, uh, of uh, reports uh, about uh, sexual offenses allegedly committed by uh, one Noel Clark. Um, this, the, 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 Following a th- I'm just going to read from the Met- Metropolitan Police statement. Following a thorough assessment by specialist detectives, it was determined the information would not meet the threshold for a criminal investigation. We have shared our findings with a third party organization and updated the complainants who subsequently contacted us following the initial report. So, you know, what this means basically is that uh, they could not find a case to bring criminal investigation. It doesn't, it doesn't let them off the hook. It doesn't, I still 100% believe. There will the, be civil suits, I'm yeah, sure. I, yeah, that too. I, I still 100% believe the dozens of women who uh, who came forward bravely to um, to speak out against yeah, this. What I say about our stupid decade? Just add this to the pile. A little bit, a little bit. Certainly not the first time that such things have uh, sort of been dismissed by, by the police as to not having a, enough of a case, but uh, that does not change uh, what happened. Um, so... There you go. There's our follow-up report on that. Um, uh, I mentioned Doctor Who magazine, 576, uh, with uh, all sorts of stuff. The, yeah, the, the big thing was uh, I never usually read the previews for um, new episodes because I, I kind of consider them spoilery. But I, I think Doctor Who magazine has done a good job on not, you know just sort of going into here's what the costumes are designed like and the, and the heads and you know the sea devils and stuff and just sort of seeing behind the scenes shots of of the heads and how they they really stuck to the original design it looks so great mm-hmm. those sea devils yeah well, just the eyes the, no ping pong eye eyeballs but other than that it's well spot there's, on. there's the yeah. bit and uh, well i've seen it elsewhere i'm assuming it's in the, the dwm um, um spiel but a bit about ray holman getting his hands on the original Original oh, uh, yeah, props yeah. and mm. uh, being able to actually use them for design purposes. So it's not like you have to, it's not like he has to, you know, sit there with a Sea Devils DVD and kind of hope no. for good angles or whatever. Like, you know, he had, he had the actual thing. Yeah. And it, the CGI's it do look great. Like they look really good. It does. And, and you know, I think we mentioned this when the, uh, when we saw the, the next time trailer at the end of Eve of the Daleks about how it's the same head, but what makes it better is that instead of just sort of like a, a glassy prop eye, you know, you can use CG to make it move and blink a little mm-hmm. bit. Like that's yeah. the added element also, that brings it alive. It's not under studio lighting. That's another thing. Or it is under, <laughs> if it is under studio lighting, it's under 60 or 40, however many years, 50 years later. Yeah. Studio lighting, so yeah. It's, it's much special. better and much more adjustable. Yeah. It, unlike, unlike multicam studio lighting, which, mm-hmm. you know, has its drawbacks, obviously. But, well, uh, which is fine. We go in knowing that and don't care when you watch, but it mm-hmm. does look better for this reason. Yeah. I agree. So... Anyway, lots of other stuff in the, in the magazine. Uh, you can pick up uh, at shops everywhere uh, on for digital, the, which is where I read For the physical copy, there's a, a book in there as well. I know. I, uh, Doctor didn't... Who Discovers Pirates. Yeah. Is that in the uh, digital one? Because I haven't looked yet. No, it's on, at least it isn't on mine. Uh, yeah. Previously un- unpublished entry in the 1970s Doctor Who Discovers book. Unpublished, really. Uh, presented for in full for the first time ever as a 52-page supplement. Unless I didn't scroll enough. I might not have scrolled enough. Maybe that wasn't it, but I'll have to have a have to have a look later on. Have to have a nosy, as they say, in the UK sometimes. Sure, sure. Anyway, um, Chris alluded to it earlier, uh, but let's so let's get right to it now. Looking back this week in history in in Doctor Who with the time lash, uh, basically things that uh, were broadcast this week. Um, and yes, uh, April third, twenty ten. 
the debut of Matt Smith uh, in what a glorious, the glorious 11th episode. Hour. Yeah, wasn't it though? Like, mm- well, and also I was like, I don't know anything about Stephen Moffat. What's this guy gonna do? I didn't really particularly like Jack. Oh my God, this is good. Yeah, <laughs> so good. I know a lot of people like you know or. I, I mean, I liked Blink. I I was okay with the Empty Child Doctor dances. A little less okay with uh, the Library Two Parter. Oh, I love the Library Two Parter. So that was my main kind of anchor for this. I mean, I, at the time, I think they it sort of like was a breath of fresh air from where <laughs> Series Four was going after the Unicorn of the Wasp and Doctor's Daughter mm-hmm. and the Suntaran Two Parter. Well, yeah, Unicorn uh, of the Wasp actually isn't that bad on further watching, but no, Doctor's but, Daughter's still kind of crap. Yeah. Um. So I I was like a, looking forward to what was going to happen, but my word. I mean, looking back at it now, though, like I think we watched it um, during the watch alongs during the early days of COVID. And I remember thinking, I loved this episode, but that pre credit scene is completely superfluous, where it's just basically the doctor going, ah, like almost falling out of the TARDIS as it flies over London and thinking, it would have been better without looking back at it. It would have been better if it just started with the opening titles and not having that at all. And the first time we see the TARDIS. <laughs> is having crashed in Amelia Pond's well, backyard. That could have been him hedging his bets on that, because everything else in there, he isn't hedging his bets. Yeah. But that bit is, is sort of the last gasp of RTD-ness, which maybe is him creating continuity of a sort. I don't but know. you're right. Like, it, it doesn't really need to be no. there, but at the time, I didn't care. It, it, like, it, at the time, that's where we left off with. So I was like, okay, now I know what's going I on. I suppose, but it feels like an afterthought. Now, now when I'm watching it now with fresh eyes, it feels like an afterthought. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. But. Yeah, like maybe the thought, oh, you know what? This is the thing at the very beginning. It just feels like they shot it on the second last day and just to cram in there. But other than that, damn perfect. Damn perfect, so, that episode. Oh, yeah, it's just so good. In 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 Britain on BBC Two, I think it is, Right. Um, there's a cooking competition show called The Great British Menu. Uh, and they have uh, representatives from various regions of the country, so London, Northeast, Southwest, whatever, right. but uh, for <laughs> for the Wales contingent, uh, this Jesus. this most recent series that just concluded uh, two, I think it was. Um, so they, uh, these chefs create dishes mm-hmm. uh, and then have them judged in, in order to try to get where them, this is going. To try to get them to a banquet. So right. at least two of the people in Wales created dishes called fish fingers and custard. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which sounds disgusting, by the yeah, way. It's yeah. funny on TV. But... Not a single one of them was appreciated in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> well, it's because it's probably revolting. I mean, <laughs> it wasn't actually, it wasn't necessarily, I should say, literal fish fingers and custard. Okay, right. good. good. They just called that in, in reference to, because they had, the, the whole point was um, for 100 years of, of British broadcasting. And so, yeah, and they had to pick, they had to pick themes for their dishes based on, on uh, things that came from their region. Uh, right. So yeah, the, some of the, the Welsh folks picked picked Doctor Who. But, and, uh, by the way, I, a lot of people don't like Time of the Doctor. I love it. But also, I just just thinking the regeneration scene at the end. <laughs> did he like after he re- sort of reset or whatever? Did he just go off to the TARDIS microwave and fire up some fish fingers? Like he had to know. take time to do that and create custard. It's a great visual gag, but it doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense when you think about it. <laughs> well. I love that Warren manages to slip in a uh, defense again <laughs> for a time of the Doctor against. I was actually slagging off a bit at the time of the Doctor. I, I know, but no, it. I'm just saying you're against the unseen invaders, I, uh, the people who you just assume that um, many people hated. dislike it. I have been told many, by pe- many friends. Many of ours. people <laughs> dislike it. Not can't hmm. quote. I'm not going to name names here, but I know some people who don't like it. I mean, yeah. it's no, it's no uh, the end of time. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, a certain end of time defender chip. Remember, remember <laughs> when? Remember, like time of the you hour. remember that uh-huh. uh, that that time? Like eleventh hour aired uh, just over what four months after the end of time. Uh, brang, brang, three, three brang, months. Three, three months, months brang. I just, I'm gonna say brang, brang the RTD because that's what it sounded like when it ended. Brang, it ended the era, and I was just so upset about everything that we had uh, for the end of time. And then we have like one of the greatest opening episodes ever in the eleventh hour. Like my word, what? Uh, Hold on, three months. What is this concept of not having to wait too long? I oh god, imagine that three months in between new eras of Doctor Who. And it probably felt like an eternity, unlike the actual eternity we're have to sit through for this next one. We have we we have got fifty percent more of our uh, like of our of our remaining Doctor Who content until November twenty twenty three is coming up in two weeks. God, we have so little Doctor Who in the next year and a half it's ridiculous um 
That wasn't the case, though, in 1964 when uh, Marco Polo, Episode 7, Assassin at Peking, uh, aired on April 4th, 1964. Uh, finishing off Marco Polo. Epic story. Set in China. Not featuring any Chinese actors um, because it was 1964. So, <laughs> As was the style at the time. As was. Uh, style? <laughs> Well, the way of things. Variety of reasons why this happened. But hey, it's Harold. It is a classic. Here's a great... I mean, the I love that it is a great story. I don't know if uh, either of you two are as familiar with it as I am, but because, uh, you know, I've watched the recon several times and stuff, and there's just a great bit at the end where, you know, after having tried to convince... Ian in episode five, I think, tries to convince Marco Polo that uh, we're time travelers, we have a time machine, and, and Marco Polo doesn't believe him and stuff. But then at the very end... You know, after they go off into the TARDIS, it goes, oh, but where are they going? In the past or in the future? And he believes them. It's such a great ending. Marco Polo. Well, if it was a Peter Davis in the era, Marco Polo would have been taken inside the console room. That's true. Everybody would have been a tour. Thing. Bring them all Probably in. Sell them a timeshare for the t- TARDIS. Yeah, exactly. Little Hodkip, everybody in. Just bring the whole <laughs> village inside at the end of the awakening. Yeah. Mar- Marco Polo being the first to, stay, to say, strike me pink. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Anyway, uh, what else happened here? Partners, Partners in crime. crime. There's a good one. We'll st- I'll stick it with some modern <laughs> who. It's rare that we do that. Um, April 5th, it is, 2008. It, was, it is, to, to quote Family of Blood, super, super fun. It is fun. Don and was back in Doctor Who. I remember. It's we're, great. I, yeah. Wasn't it, uh, thinking back here, Warren, wasn't I having to sort of convince you that uh, Donna Noble... Uh, Catherine Tate being back at Doctor Who is going to be a good thing. Cause I, I, Consider me convinced. Still yeah. my favorite new era companion. I think, yeah, I think she'd rubbed you the wrong way in The Runaway Bride. And I thought, you know she what? I everyone like, the wrong way in The Runaway Bride. Yeah, I think. Well, I, that was calculated on their part. So, yeah. I remember being, you know what? I think this will work. I think the comedic timing between Tennant and Tate were, were really good. And so I think I was, I, I don't remember though. I, I don't was, know how I mean, down on the that. The adipose are kind of stupid, but who cares? The rest of it is fantastic. It's, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Yes, Chris. I, uh, I, 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 was, I, I was still I was still living in the UK at the time when that's uh, right, that's right. When this went out, and I I was fortunate enough to get to, to get to the the premiere party uh, uh, set up by Jeremy Bentham. Oh, and, the uh, patron, we, uh, the mother of uh, of Doctor Who fandom, yeah, the Queen Mother. Yes, the Queen Mother. Um, there we go. That's what I wanted to say. And uh, yeah, at a, at a pub in well, near Farringdon. Anyway, um, great great time. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people. I got reasonably drunk before the show even started. But <laughs> oh, what wow. a very COVID story this is. Oh, I know this is great. <laughs> but I, I still remember at the time um, calling the appearance of Rose before it happened, and and uh, <laughs> seeing, ruining it for everyone. <laughs> I, I kept it to myself. I'm like, I think this is going to happen. And then a couple minutes later, it does. But just the um, the reaction of, of the crowd watching when that happened was was uh, massive, which obviously oh. was the intention. Oh, at home, yeah. too. I was like, what? Well, they left it out of the, uh, the, the, the preview screen. press screening, yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is pretty cool. Well done. Well, remember, oh, those are, those are the days when they would hide stuff from the press. Oh. Or, back you know, when you could. Yeah. Back when, back when, when you had when the option. <laughs> Well, they'd have to hide stuff from the press. Yeah. If you think, if you think uh, less far back in time to, was it Asylum of the Daleks? Stephen uh, Moffat at the press screening said, please don't report on the presence of Clara. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and they and all the press are like, okay. I know, they played along. Oh, it was so great those days. Or um, oh. whichever Comic-Con was San Diego, where they had that trailer the for whatever upcoming thing. And, it was and Day of the Doctor. Was the day of the doctor? Yeah, it was the day and, of the doctor. And, and the, the whole crowd, 4,000 or whatever people in Hall H were asked, please don't talk about this. And, and they, they didn't. They didn't. And we, and we have never seen uh, a video, like, uh, 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 you know, I think they I think they actually, did they confiscate phones at those panels? I don't remember. I don't know. But like, to this day, like, it, it was an incomplete trailer for Day of the Doctor that, that aired at Comic-Con 2013. And uh, to this day, we've never seen it. Like, is I it, looked it, high and low, high every low. licit and illicit source I could find. Yeah. I could not find it anywhere. This... My internet detection was... Now, I'm going to point out that okay. just to call back to our originally what I said about journalism, right. that is why we can't have nice things. Now, those guys would find it, whatever it might be, and just spit it 15 articles from Sunday. And so that's part of the reason we don't... we Secrets are not kept anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Anyway, partners of crime, Don and Noble. Uh, yeah. I want to. I want to. I want to move, move on to your. I want to move on to your favorite there, Stephen. Oh that. yeah. <laughs> on on the sixth of April, the Rings of Akaton. Oh man, twenty thirteen. Yep. Um. I, th- let, okay. Yes, Warren, you're gonna say I'm gone. I was just gonna say I dislike this intensely, but if you watch the behind the scenes footage, you will see friends of the show, Meta and friends Brian in the background helping that's, out. So that's that's the one star out of five. I know. That's why I, we had Meta on the commentary that we did because she I, was I know involved in the costume. I uh, I felt bad about that because I know they're they're on it and uh, you know I, I often say that it you know like the end of time like Doctor Who very very rarely lets me down because I am very <laughs> easy to please when it comes to Doctor. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah. And so when it does let me down, it just feels like it's a, such a crushing blow, and uh, that's why I can count like on like the end of time. Uh, even I even enjoyed Silver Nemesis well, on first watch, but it's terrible now that I look back at it. Warren and, Warren jumping in to defend Time of the Doctor. I mean. There's some stuff in 7B that's less than less than fantastic. It's less than... And then it comes right back to great. Because Stephen Moffat's busy trying to uh, cobble together Day of the Doctor and succeeds. And so I look at 7B going, you know what? Every misfire that happens here because Moffat couldn't give it his full attention, yeah. I will take because Day of the Doctor is perfect. Uh, and this is I one love... Of this is one of them. I love every single of the Doctor. Knight, yeah. uh, name, name is great. I think underrated, frankly. I think there's some fantastic stuff in yeah. there. Yeah. Besides the nostalgia hat tips, which I also love, uh-huh. um, uh, and then I love time too. So yeah. Yeah, but oh god, Akaton. So Akaton, Neil Cross. But the wrote, costumes are good, so there is. That. Well, sure, and the, and the creatures are great. Uh, Neil Cross wrote Hyde and was really good. Hyde is good. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. And then he says, "Well, guess what? We have a slot here, Neil Cross. If you could maybe write something." Based, really based on how much we liked Hyde, <laughs> yeah. can you do us another story? Yeah. And, and he did. He came up with the Rings of Acton. And it's all just singing. And I, what I hate about it is that it's just a bunch of speeches. It's just a. It's basically just like saying, hey, Matt Smith, you're good at speeches. Make some speeches. Fill some time <laughs> until next but, week. Or, 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 all the, or all the frou-frou stuff about the leaf and whatnot. Yeah. Oh, God. I think all three of us agree, uh, but I think there's a lot of people out there who love it. So uh, yeah. I, I, I absolutely like it a lot more than either of you. You, too, I know you that do. Much. You do. I I'm not, I'm not a fan. It. But I hated yeah. it. Yeah, it is easily my least favorite Matt Smith episode. Easily. <laughs> where do you remember where it finished up on the low? Um, it finished low. Thankfully, a lot of people agreed with me. <laughs> me specifically. Upon rewatching Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, despite some fun bits to it, is kind of in that general neighborhood. Although oh, is it really? Slightly no. more expensive one. Eh, it's not great. Yeah, well, that's fun. It's more fun than not. Maybe, maybe because they're oh, singing. True, yes. They're singing in songs. It's basically just Matt Smith explaining everything. What's what's happening. Oh, what's happening? She's singing about this. Oh, that, it, 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 it's a bad story if you're having to have the doctor explain everything that's happening as opposed to we're watching something that's happening. Anyway, Rings of Akaton, April 6, 2013. <laughs> I was really mad at it. Uh, uh, and, and, yeah. <laughs> Let's stick with new series this time, Lash. Why not? Because this is this is a good week for this. Uh, the the Shakespeare Code aired April seventh, two thousand seven. I will always maintain that the original title for this, Love Labors One, was a much better title. But no, oh, oh yes, yeah. they yes, decided yes. to go with the then current Da Vinci Code, uh, the Book of Which. Uh, was inspired by Henry Lincoln, who uh, there's an article on in Doctor Who magazine, oddly enough, because he was a scholar in that way. Uh, yeah, should have got should have been called that, but no. Let's let's try and hammer into the Da Vinci Code uh, um, uh, zeitgeist, and who remembers the, the Da Vinci Code now? But we we would remember mm. Love Labors one, and that wasn't what they called it anyway. No, Dan Brown's a terrible writer, but on the other hand, he hasn't dropped quite as badly as J.K. Rowling has. I'll True. give him that, as far yeah. as I know. Yes, uh, Shakespeare, though. Dean Lennox Kelly in the lead role of Shakespeare. A bunch of Shakespeare references in there that went over my head because I don't know Shakespeare very much. Uh, but uh, an enjoyable romp. It's it's fun. It's got its problems, but it's fun. Mm-hmm. Um, I do enjoy, to this day, the uh, part where Shakespeare comes out of the doctor and he says 6,000 academics just pump their fist in the air. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was a great line. That was good. Good stuff. Speaking of problematic authors. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Shakespeare Code. Um, although we uh, uh, let's let's dip back into a little bit because there's there's three episodes. One that air around this time, April seventh, nineteen seventy three, Planet of the Daleks. Uh, 
picks up on the big cliffhanger from Frontier in Space and then promptly ignores it because Terry Nation's writing, <laughs> writing its own damn thing at that point. Just like, ah, oh, let's cobble together some greatest hits of what I did before and call it an episode. And hey, guess what? There's Daleks at the end of it. Even though the Doctor specifically went to this planet to find the Daleks, he is surprised the Daleks are there at the end of it. Planet of the Daleks, episode <laughs> one. Thanks, Good Terry Nation. Time. Good times. Uh, April 8th uh, sees two debuts, hence we mention them here. Uh, April uh, 1967, The Faceless Ones, uh, notable because it exists. It exists in the BBC archives still, uh, uh, which is, of course, the beginning of the end for Ben and Polly. What a great story in that Ennis Lloyd says, I don't want Ben and Polly here anymore. Let's write them out. <laughs> Not even let's write them out at the end of the story. Let's write them out during the story. We're done with them. And so episode one is more or less the last time we properly see Ben and Polly in Doctor Who. Quite something. Um, and of course, is the animated version too, which uh, I haven't seen the animated version of episode one because it, because it I exists. And I have to watch it. Yeah. I, I, I might have bought it and I still don't. Still haven't watched it. Uh, what about you, Chris? Is it still in the wrapping, Faceless Ones, or have you watched that one yet? No, I've gone through it. The only, right now, the only things I've got sitting on the shelf that I haven't watched, well, Web of Fear, the re-release, because right. I'm in no rush to get to that, having what? already bought the darn thing twice. Yeah. Well, three times now. Um, Evil of the Daleks is the only one I've yet to get to. However, of course, this coming week is uh, the release of both Galaxy 4 and Season 17 on Blu-ray. Well, so. here, here's hoping anyway. I, I have I, I've Amazon got the says tr- it's, uh, on its, I know. It's Amazon great. says a lot of I things. I know they do. I got an email saying Amazon is shipping my, my Tom Baker Season 6, Season 17 Blu-ray. So apparently that's on the way by, to arrive here on Tuesday. Oh, don't let me down, please. I've been waiting months for this. I need to see it again. I've seen season 17 more times than I can count, but see, still. I, I criticize you guys, but yeah. my White Whale, which is a customized BBC cameraman and camera, is on its way this week as <laughs> well, So, which I saw on eBay and snapped up for $100. Yeah, more about that next week. Uh, yep. so if it for, arrives yeah. this week. For what it's worth, just to backtrack a smidgen, sure. uh, in the 2014, the, the most recent Doctor Who magazine poll, Okay. Uh, ranking, oh, you've been looking at this. Okay, ranking yeah. stories. Uh, the Rings of Akuten was uh, in the bottom 10. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. And coming, in, coming in number 233 out of 241. Wow. Ouch. That's it's not good. that bad. Is that, the, is that the lowest ranking modern series episode? Fear Her is uh, second worst. <laughs> Fear Her is even it's, lower. It's the worst other than Fear Her. Wow. And then uh, the next, the next um, four spots higher is uh-huh. Doctor Widow Wardrobe. And then Curse of the Black Spot, two wow. spots ahead of that. Doctor Widow Wardrobe really fared badly, too. I mean, I didn't yeah, like that bottom, either. But, bottom 15, uh, along yeah. with uh, Curse of the Black Spot. I and greatly dislike that Obviously, Love as well. of Monsters, not that much higher than that, but... Yeah. And then Daleks in Manhattan, a little above Which that, but... Yeah. nonsense. Love of Monsters is great. I will die on this hill. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. I like Love of Monsters. Uh, yeah. Mutants. Rings, Rings of Oxygen, second worst new series. Man, that's... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel uh, somewhat validated by that, given that I really <laughs> disliked that episode at the time. Really disliked it. Which is super rare for me. Like, I haven't... I hadn't felt that rage in three years. Uh, you are pleasable. Three You're very, very pleasable. Three years three months and five days essentially since end of time happened uh yeah i am very easily pleasable uh even the mutants even the mutants episode one which i i, I liked more or less uh i think later on it sort of goes a bit pear-shaped but uh, i enjoy episodes one and uh of stories and that was all right aired 1972 um, april 8th for whatever it's worth uh, the end of time was ranked number 82 overall that's ridiculous that's wrong so it's wrong just it's wrong roughly top third it's wrong it's my well, least favorite. I don't want to so. defend that time because I just like it as well. But a lot of people do love it, Chip. Uh, I do. So. <laughs> Chip now, I, let me point out, Chip is mostly a defender of Journey's End, which I think uh, we kind of he poo-pooed. Was, yeah, yeah it, that's what propelled our, him to our, start. Our dislike of Journey's End spurred on his uh, desire yeah, I'm sorry, to Chip. I'm being unfair. I'm unfairly yeah. focusing on Yeah, that. I actually haven't asked Chip what his thoughts are on End of Time. I'm sure he likes it more than we do because everyone would. Um uh, here's a story that that uh, that Chris loves more than the 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 two of us, Warren. Uh, even though mm-hmm. we like it, it's not like we hate it. The Unquiet Dead. Still your is it still your favorite oh, um, uh, excellent story? Aired a- April 9th, two thousand five. That is that still your favorite, uh, Chris? Mm, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I honestly, I'll flip flop between like the finale or Dalek or Bad Wolf or right. 
or not pedal, um, uh, and, uh, yeah, um, I'm quite dead, whatever, like, yeah, uh, it's, it's up there, it's mm -hmm. top half for sure, every, always. It's, it's the diehard of Doctor Who stories and that it is most definitely a Christmas Doctor Who story that does not air at, oh, yeah. at Christmas, you know? It was, well, yeah, because uh, Christmas, for, uh, Doctor Who at Christmas wasn't yet a thing. No, it wasn't. Little yeah, did they know. First, first historical uh, celebrity historical. Yep. Um, it's not not the start of Bad Wolf stuff that was uh, the week before, but uh, the big genesis of Bad Wolf stuff, especially yeah. with, uh, especially with um, uh, uh, Eve, Eve Miles, Miles in there. Yeah. And yeah, I I have to. I'm wondering because I know we've been sort of going back in the in the history of uh, of, of series one. Because we're in the, the beginning of it here in history in 2005. And I know they announced that a new series was being commissioned in, like, on March 30th, 2005. I don't remember when they said Doctor Who's going to have a Christmas special. I don't remember if that came at the same time or if it came after Series 1. I don't remember when the... when It the, might have even come before. Yeah. Like, was that announced at the same time? Guess what? Doctor Who's coming back for not only one, but two seasons, and it's getting a Christmas special. I don't remember... Because I, you know, because I'm quite dead being so Christmassy. Um, I don't remember thinking, hey, wow, this is like a Christmas special. Never mind a Christmas special that we're going to get at Christmas. This feels like Christmas. I don't remember thinking that at the time. But well, we had no context for it, really. We didn't, no. Didn't have a podcast at the time, Warren. Even though we were already planning it. I think we were already planning it, even by then. Because we planned yes, the fateful Starbucks meeting on White Avenue. I know we planned this show a <laughs> long time before it actually showed. We could have been, we could have been like current. We could have been Podshock, like current with Doctor Who, had we got our. Well, we weren't. We were lazy, yeah. which we repaired. I think in the past 12, 13, whatever it is. Years. I know, but Podshock's gone, and we're still carrying on like suckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what were you thinking? Come on, <laughs> what are we doing? Not only are we t not only are we still doing a Doctor Who podcast, we're talking about stuff that we did before we started this Doctor yeah, Who podcast. It's a bit much, isn't it? Is <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed of ourselves, actually. Yeah, this is a long time, long time before we're talking about 2005. Anyway, uh, that's it. Uh, that's it this week for the uh, that what happened this week in Doctor Who history in the time lash. Um, let's talk about some uh, some big finish stuff. Big finish, Mind of the Hodiac. Uh, with, of course, is RTD's uh, very first Doctor Who script um, is out and from Big Finish now. It's out there now. It's even got... It ha does it have... Uh, Chris, you send us a link uh, on, on... But I don't know if you included it, but it, it includes a uh, an interview with one Russell the Davies... Uh, mm -hmm. as part of the, um, uh, and Bonnie the, Langford and uh, yeah, features. uh, it's part of the just bonus stuff Yeah, released bonus by Big Finish, which there's a lot I, of great bonus stuff on those. It can you be. Know, yeah. Audio VAM and stuff like that. Big Finish does, does good work in that stuff. It's not just the stories. It's the VAM. Always a big fan. Yeah, of I mean, that, I could hear the music, the little, uh, the interstitial music <laughs> that they do in between you know, <laughs> every single interview. Mm -hmm. Um, I, uh, a few minutes ago I was, uh, mentioning having, you know, paid for web of fear three times yep uh the only reason that we keep doing that is over and above the fact we're getting some slightly different stuff in this case the animated uh, episode three uh yep. but like the, the bonus material like because the original release was dry there's nothing on it uh recon of episode three etc um so um when bonus stuff is created and released, then it definitely, like they say, they, they literally call it value added. It's absolutely value added because, I mean, how many times have we bought five doctors or, um, you know, insert story <laughs> name here? Yeah. I mean, other than the rights reasons, which I'm sure are plentiful because there's usually third parties doing this, why don't streaming services have the extras on? Like Disney does a little oh, bit of this. Oh, yeah. But I, just, just put a commentary on there. You've already got it. Just put on the old commentary. I know. Like, come on. Deb Stanish from Verity is very, uh, very adamant that uh, they, you know, I mean, all the Marvel stuff, all the, the stuff. DVDs, mm -hmm. as far as I know, have commentaries. I know the Avengers <laughs> yeah. one does because I bought that off iTunes. Uh, Deb, so just put them on there. Deb used like COVID stimulus checks to buy. Doctor yeah. Who oh yeah. She bought all the Blu-rays. She bought all the Blu-rays <laughs> just for the VAM. Yeah. That's 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 an excellent use of COVID. Oh. I didn't mind to buy a Dragon Frame stop motion. So there you go. <laughs> we all buy what we what we need to get through. We this didn't thing. we didn't get such things here in Alberta. 
No. Yeah, that's because BC is special as per usual. Oh, uh, well. Uh, hey, hey it, it hosted a Doctor Who uh, shooting. I mean, they've made Doctor Who in your home, prov- uh, home province. This yeah, is your kinda, home, Warren. Did, yeah. This province is your home, no matter how far <laughs> no, you no, try to get no. away from it. Absolutely not. Uh, you were I'm born like the here. third Doctor is stuck. <laughs> I know. Um, also from Big Finish Torchwood, uh, Torchwood War Chest is coming May 2022. Uh, Dead Plates is coming June 2022 as, as the Torchwood saga continues. Uh, the Emancipation of the Daleks audio novel is due July of 2022. I would, I'd like, I have three comments on this cover. All right. First of all, do Daleks really need to be emancipated? I don't know about that. I can't think of a race less likely to be emancipated than <laughs> well, Daleks. We'll They're the, usually the ones enslaving people. Um, the the Dalek and Dalek bills. needed emancipation. Yep. I suppose that's true, yes. Uh, there's dueling bills in this, which I find interesting. Uh-huh. Also, it looks like the Daleks are, in fact, Taklafanes on this cover. It's Maybe. very strange. Maybe. Read read more and find out. It's an audio novel. It's uh, it's an, it's sort of like an, an enhanced audio book written by Johnny Morris. Uh, Dan Starkey reads it, but it also feels like, you know, especially composed music, mm-hmm. sound effects, and, a, you know, of course, Daleks, whenever Daleks come up, it's Nicholas Briggs uh, doing the voices of. So um, so it's a whole thing. It's a seven-hour audio book, uh, and it's coming July 2022. From Big Finish. So there you go. There's a whole host of Big Finish stuff coming, as they usually do, because they put out a lot of stuff. Um, this is uh, cool. I, I think we might have talked about this before, and and then it disappeared off the internet. Well, it's back. Wonderful books. Uh, Paul Smith, wonderful books. Of course, has done many wonderful books, oddly enough. Uh, has put up together a video. This is expressly for me, just for me. Deep, this video. Deep, deep dive. Deep for me. It's a 15-minute-ish video about how they did TARDIS dematerialization effects through the years. It's not just roll back and mix, like here's a shot and we just mix between the two shots and the TARDIS is gone. There's been all sorts of different techniques to do it over the years, especially before roll back and mix became a thing. And it's all outlined in the video, in the show notes, on YouTube. It's great. I love here's, stuff like this. <laughs> here's a peek behind the curtain as to how much this is in Steven's wheelhouse. Yeah. I sent him a text saying, Steven, there's paperwork in the opener. This is expressly <laughs> for you. And then he chimes in with, and floor plans. And floor plans. It's so great. It's really cool. So if you, if you like those things like I do, I hope you'll enjoy Your love that for Manusha goes to the quantum level. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I am a special case. I. Uh, I. I. I do. You know. I don't. I don't watch any. Yeah, new series. we all are. We absolutely. We, we are. are. I just I, got an action figure of a BBC cameraman. <laughs> yeah. What specifically one from the sixties? Who the hell am I to judge? Yeah. He, look, he looks so disgruntled. That's the best part. <laughs> he looks so disgruntled. Of course he's disgruntled. Of course he's disgruntled. He's, sick. he's just waiting for his tea break. That's yeah. all he wants. He's, he's probably like, waiting what for is, them. What is this science fiction garbage that I yeah. have to work exactly. on? Exactly. Why aren't I working on, I don't know, whatever. Well, yeah. I'm not, why am I not doing the latest Pride and Prejudice adaptation? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> when, when that, or the when, kitchen table drama of uh, the play at one or whatever yeah. it's called. When, when that special figure, uh, probably, hopefully by the next episode, we'll uh, we'll put it in the show notes and talk about it and, uh, and show it off <laughs> on the Twitter account because uh, it, it deserves uh, it. It deserves. So, it's so great. Um, uh, so anyway, watch watch the video. It's so good. It's so good. That be, between that and I know that um, uh, Gav Rymel has been working very hard for very long time on season two of Terry Nation Army. I, I'm a Patreon and uh, I've seen previews of stuff and things, but like the, these videos. Uh, take a long time and a lot of research, but they're they're so up my alley. Yeah. They are so niche and so good that I just eat them up. So yeah, thank it's, you. Creators. It's it's still fantastic to see um, because a lot of the stuff is done for no money. Like None. it's just done for the oh, love yeah. of just things. Just for love. Yeah. So whether it's whether it's, uh, it's Terry Nation Army, whether it's this, whether it's you know Josh Schneer is doing his stuff, whether it's uh, podcasts, whatever, whatever. It's I yeah. just love, I love seeing fandom doing good cool stuff. right exactly That's like I, I i started watching this tardis dematerialization video and i got maybe four minutes in i'm like this is this is not my you know it's great <laughs> oh, it's great it. but it's not yeah. up my alley like it is much, yours, much as i give yeah. give steven jive about minutia i'm uh, not as bad as him but i'm 60 percent <laughs> of the way there when it comes to broadcast technology stuff for sure yeah, there's well, other totally. stuff Yep, there's other Absolutely. stuff. In, yep. You know, we've we've all got our things, whether it's car engines or, or whatever. Like, yeah. But um, yeah, it's like that wasn't for me, but I damn well appreciate the effort that went into it. Mm-hmm. Well done, creators. Well done. Um, 
yeah, links to the show notes if you want to watch that video. Um, we, we always like to pass things like that along. Like that, like the Matt Berry thing for crying out loud. Rob Ritchie didn't oh, make that glorious. for money either. And it's Absolutely superb. Glorious. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there's something you can't pay money for. Doctor Who, The Return of Robin Hood, the paperback book written by Paul Mars is coming out July 2020, July 21st of this calendar year. Um, apparently it features, uh, Doctor Who the fourth, uh, and the season 17, according to the cover, because it's uh, Tom Baker from that season, from the uh, season 17 TARDIS coming out there. So, um, yeah, the fourth Doctor returns to Sherwood Forest in this incredible new crossover of Doctor Who and the legend of Robin Hood. There you go. <laughs> books that's coming out uh as i said in july uh and lastly before the commentary um we mentioned last week about how uh dwast doctor who appreciation society was handing it out at the capitol the the inaugural uh terence dix award for writers it was awarded this past weekend to none other than doctor who legend gary russell well done gary congratulations, congratulations. well deserved well deserved what a great looking statue too roger doliato yep about to <laughs> miniaturize her <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> as or some people said, hey, it looks like a cigar. It uh, well, no, it's his little tissue. But oddly enough, it is. I I wonder if you know because it's a little statue of Roger Delgado aiming his tissue compression eliminator. Has he just been? tissue compression eliminated himself did he do this somehow <laughs> did he hold the wrong end yeah, that's what and then now he's forever a statue um that gets handed out to um also Ray isn't Russell. a cigar canon isn't i can't remember the story but there's, Mind of evil. there's a story where Dugato was yeah there Mind you go. Of evil, yeah. just watched it yeah just yep. watched uh, watching episode six tonight yeah of course he's standing on a platform of the the gallifrey logo which wasn't seen until revenge of the cyber and so a little anachronistic but uh <laughs> <laughs> so oh, yes, yes, this statue <laughs> yeah. has nothing to do with Doctor Who, other than being awarding a writer with Doctor Who. It's anachronistic. C- congratulations on the yeah. congratulations on the award, <laughs> Gary Russell. However, we do have some questions and issues about the statue. Well, the question which, is, does Gary does that bug Gary Russell? Because it might, well, it might actually, it bug might, him. it might. You know, given his personality, these things might he's, annoy him. He's he's got his yeah, he's got his own set of bug bears to say the yeah. least. <laughs> We uh, all do. We, we all can't do. just. Yeah. As, it's not fair to Gary. We all have our own <laughs> dumb little ticks about oh, yeah. Doctor Who. As, I'm sure I could come up with ten of them off the top of my head if I wanted yeah. to. As evidence, as Steve will come up with ten just from Rings of Aquaton. Oh my God, we will. Uh, but hopefully not ten from the Planet of Evil episode three, uh, the classic series commentary of which follows right now. are most merciful. We're looking forward to excellent duodecaphonic sound. This is the moment when I get a real feeling of job satisfaction. Welcome back. It's uh, our Doctor Who classic series commentary uh, for Planet of Evil, part three. I think we talked about some of uh, part two uh, amidst uh, discussion of Captain Power and... uh, (laughs) Other stuff. Listen, I, I television I, physics. I, I, I am, I'm amazed sometimes, chaps. Uh, we, we uh, believe it or not, we're recording this all in one go and spreading it out over the course of what four weeks or four days. If you're a Patreon supporter, but uh, I was just sort of thinking, like, man, we've been doing this like over 15 years, and like we never run out of stuff to talk about even though it's i was gonna say not once <laughs> if we stayed on topic I, no. but sure to, to be fair a lot of the time it's the same thing over and over probably but i wasn't expect the captain power thing that is just like unlocked a whole new you know uh side <laughs> in, in, quest in, in my mind in, here in our, we should probably start the episode so it doesn't run for an hour here but we, in, in in our recording break uh steven re-familiarized himself with the opening credits and man had some are flashbacks. you happy or sad about yeah. that it was right there i hadn't watched that in like a 30 35 years and it's like i oh yep yeah. and then this shot comes up and then they fly up that's the one that's the show locked in my brain for 35 years man <laughs> I can't. I listen. I can't follow an. I can't follow a folk song, less less let alone an audio book, uh, without losing. You know, getting distracted. But I can remember the opening title sequence to a stupid Canadian kids TV show <laughs> from 1989. Yeah. We're all cursed with this. Oh, I don't also, understand. Not it. remembering being able to remember a folk song. I don't. They think you're getting off pretty late. <laughs> just like the six minutes. Well, what happens to the boat, Gordon Lightfoot? Just tell us what happens to the boat. <laughs> Edmund Fitzgerald? Who the hell is that? I Come know. on. <laughs> what, would you, what would you do with that hammer, Leonard, Leonard Nimoy? Would you hammer in the morning? <laughs> See, that I never got Who that far. Who is Bilbo Baggins again? That I know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let's do this. Uh, part, part three of Planet of Evil on your legally purchased Blu-rays, which I hope you all have. Uh, here we are. 
in three, two, one, play. So Planet of Evil rather than Planet of Fire or Face of Evil. Thank you, because I did I... Face of Fire. Where's that episode? Face... Where's that lost story? Well, Chibnall's got one more chance to do it. You can call on it's, that. It's so. just it's just somebody you've never heard of and their face is on fire and that's all they do yeah. the whole episode is scream, my face is on fire, my face is on fire. Is and they just, and the rest of the crew just kind of stands around and watches mm -hmm. it. And then they cut to an actual, they break the fourth wall and it's actually the crew watching this guy on fire. Nobody doing anything. It's performance. <laughs> that sounds like an point. episode of Black Mirror. Yeah, it does actually. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, we're gonna have enough of a reprise. Yeah, so when we see the cockpit, if you watch like the uh, the the keyed in video, uh, mm -hmm. just watch like the lights above right. and below, okay. and, and just like the 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 uh, well, blur or I don't know what the best word to use for the effect is, but all right, I will watch if if they ha if they have it, I guess. Yeah, because it's possible they won't cut back to the. This I don't is... know if this was. I don't know if this was remounted, or if it's just. <laughs> they just like reenact playback from actual episode two. It's it's the actual episode two in editing. Last uh, last look at Tom Baker's original Doctor Who coat there too. By the way, um, mm. free of the scarf. I think he's done at this right. Yeah, because he's, he's yeah, on. Yeah, if the... you look at the lights, oh, just yeah. like the yeah. That's not that's not those, those are, are black, actual lights. Like the blackout kind of bit. Yeah, things. those are lights. Those that's, are just that's lights. tube. That's hitting the tubes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Is that that's what just, it is? Okay. Yep. Yeah. It's yep. just interfering with the tubes. Because like you were admonished in TV school not to not to shoot a light too directly because it will streak the lens and screw up. It could screw up the tubes. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening there. Okay. As will happen sometimes when you see a machine gun fired in the studio and it uh, rattles yeah, the same tubes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, same same, same reason. Literally rattling yeah. tubes. This is cool. <laughs> Same, I don't call, know why it's same cool, cause and reason. Same cause, yeah. It's often like I remember like watching some of Hartnell's stuff and thinking, "Oh, is that like an early video effect for that gun?" No, it's just the bright light interfering the camera tube. It was nothing. They probably wanted to edit that out, but they didn't know how to. See, look at there. There's Davros. There he is. I'm just mm -hmm. sitting here, just sitting at the desk. I'm a desk jockey. That's what I am. Yeah, I created <laughs> an iconic villain a year ago, and this is my life now. Man, the thing is, he's an iconic villain. I mean, he is. And mm -hmm. He's great. He's fantastic in the role. I'm not cutting him down. But to the British viewing public, he probably wasn't even that guy. He was nope. that guy who showed up on Doctor Who and was kind of cool. Yep. And then they forgot about it because they weren't watching it on videotape. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was just it was just a thing that happened, just like every other TV thing that happened. It's also really yeah. good in Ambassadors of Death as a reporter. Oh, well, very um, good. But even like he, you talk about his like him in a mask and stuff, like you know, uh, in Carnival of Monsters and a mask. And French of the Cybermen. In Genesis, Revenge of the I was going to yeah. say Revenge of the Cybermen. Which a, is made before a, Genesis. A and it's, yeah, it's just like, ah, oh, well, you were a Vogon. You could be Dabros, right? right? You could be the icon iconic lead villain of this one. You can do that. Okay. Uh, don't worry. We'll, we'll get you back to like desk roles for your next Doctor Who story. <laughs> but, but you know, for uh, for all the... Uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. Never mind. <laughs> I had a big point to make and it's gone now. It's Liz Sladen crawling across a pretty uh, convincing looking jungle here. Yeah, that might have something to do with it. Avoiding stuff. I bet you that thing that hit her in the face that she reacted brilliant to is probably the cameraman accidentally brushing that and knocking it into this her face. This is pretty great, too. This is very this is, Tommy. It is a bit, isn't Pitball it? Pitball wizard. This is kind of also a little bit like, speaking of antimatter, we're kind of like in El Singulero territory here. We are. Mm -hmm. I expect a wrestling match any moment yeah. now. Man, the Pyrrhon's getting a workout. Oh, it is. But it looks so good on film. That's a thing. And it's dark. And That's it's... true. It does. This is pretty hippy-dippy stuff, though, right now, i got to tell you. It is. This is... Uh... Oh, okay. Oh, what do you got there, Chris? I was just looking at the... Uh... For some reason, I had it stuck in my mind. I, I didn't... I wanted to look up who did the voice of Boss in Green Death. So that was... a guy that played Lupton in Planet of the Sweaty, which I don't know that I ever knew. Also, yep. I, I remembered my train of thought, which was Receive Fan Wisdom. Hmm. has its good side because without people ranting on and on about how great Michael Wisher was, the only people who cared, writing fanzines and eventually, you know, infiltrating the ranks of real literature and TV and everything else, mm -hmm. we would not, have, there wouldn't be as much respect for Michael Wisher, not anything to do with how good his performance was. No. Because people hadn't gone on and on and on about it. And people who were doing that were the insane fans at the time. That is very true. We We helped elevate an actor's career, I think. God help us. We what did something it? good. I don't I don't believe that. <laughs> We're going to have to make up for that. Oh, quarantine area. How quaint. Um, <laughs> otherwise known as disaster zone. 
Or is it disaster? You're taking all the booze away. Like we're quarantined, we're getting yeah. drunk. You're talking the hitchhikers thing. Hitchhikers gun, yeah. Yeah, disaster area. I want to say. I use spending a year dead for tax reasons more than I should. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say, at all. Steps. All right, his futuristic rubber boots. Yeah. In his uh, yeah, those look so cheap. And his brown with other brown jumpsuit there that he's got going on. I mean, that's 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 the seventies. And, out and also yeah. the rubber boots are brown fur lined. Uh huh. Or whatever fur, or whatever. Why was why was like I just I always assume the seventies was a dirty, filthy decade, based probably on two things: the fact that every fashion was brown, yeah, and and that film looked like crap. Sixty millimeter film, <laughs> yeah, film yeah. stocks, which has nothing to do with how. I mean, I lived through the guy seventies for God's yeah. sake. Like, I know for a fact that wasn't that dirty, but was hmm. it though? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Our house is yellow. It's pretty neat. My low is nineteen seventy nine. So lots of green and orange and. Yeah. In my, uh, my you know, Alberta's a pretty time. dusty place but in the summer, so. I thought he had a, oh, it's a, um, that's his tin that he's got there. Oh. Altoids. Altoids. <laughs> I was thinking if it's. It it has, got kitten breath. Yeah. Oof. From making out with all his kittens. <laughs> It's gotta be claustrophobic for the guy standing under that overhang with like no clearance above his oh, head. Oh yeah, you would have you would have not done well on this set. I feel like I wouldn't either, to be honest. No, that has not much clearance on that door. Mm-mm. That Graham West. What I want to what's room that, up top what that, What's yeah. what's that red thing inside that pole? What's that for? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, oh, they use it. It's a pneumatic actually, tube for sending messages. They do use it. It actually comes into play in episode four. So. Oh, okay. So oh, yeah, isn't it radioactive or something? Thing. Something like that. It's like the oh, core. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. They take that's it out. That's a terrible and... place to keep the core of the ship. Yeah, because they take it out against the energy it get, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Spoilers, but. Spoilers. <laughs> Spoilers for 1975. Yeah. That's just the, next them shining a different light <laughs> on, onto a prop thing. That's, that's that effect right yeah. there. Well, the fun part was in episode two, when they first did that, you mm-hmm. could see when they cut and restarted, it was and literally, the camera had slightly shifted position. I know. They did it that way. They like cut in between different shots as opposed to actually just sort of like dissolving from one or two. It was, it was a weird decision on Dave Mulaney's part. It, it's just the, the, the dramatic leap in technology between filming episode two and episode three. <laughs> hey, two weeks <laughs> Huge had passed. quantum leap. Two weeks had passed. Maybe they had thought, Look, you know what? he's talking to an iPhone. Yeah. Come on. Maybe, maybe they actually literally thought, you know what? That didn't go so well in the uh, previous block. Let's do it slightly differently in the second one. I wonder if that <laughs> could be just as simple as that. So the lesson, kids, is never put radioactive crystals into a dog bowl. Yeah. So I got to think he he would have had like contact lens type things uh, over top of his eyes. I oh yeah. So here he's got like um, probably like essentially like blue eye things in there because it's CSO that's going in there right now. Yeah. I think piece of blue cardboard uh, paper, or construction paper, or something. Or is it front actual protection? Maybe I don't know because that feels. Um, unnaturally glowing and then of course he'll bow down and we'll cut to a new shot and he's got it out but so i have to look at the info text i suppose perhaps it would say i can't remember i think richard molesworth did the uh, info text here he's mostly concerned with when things were recorded um which is not always that interesting uh (laughs) Uh, andrew pixley i don't believe you Uh, when you say that martin wiggins does my favorite uh doctor who production notes that's not a bold statement there or anything but Little Tom Baker. Okay, let's let's hook him up to the um, what's that? The library thing where you take a sheet of plastic and you read a newspaper off it. Microfilm. Yeah, microfilm. Mm-hmm. Let's hook him up to the microfilm. Or microfiche. Yeah, microfiche actually is the proper term. Anyway, that looks like they're hooking up to a microfiche. Microfiche. A fish. A fish. They're shooting this. Do those in still June. exist, I wonder, in libraries. <clears throat> What's that? Microfiche? Probably. They exist. They do. Be libraries. They do. I think. I remember using them as a kid, like uh, for like book reports and stuff. Well, I went in to use them to find uh, old um, TV listings to find out. Of course, you Doctor did. Who. Episodes, <laughs> of course, you, you know. For my sins, Tom Baker here, and this is what June seventy five. So we're Chris and I are all of you know five or six months old at this point. Not I'm even. four and a half. Tom Baker is 41. 
madness in this. And he's still around. Crazy. Well, he's, the company. Y- he's younger here than we are now by many years. In your case, Warren, True. a decade. <laughs> yeah, go to hell. <laughs> it just, it's it's weird, isn't it? Because whenever like whenever I watch like old hockey from the sixties or seventies, like there is no way that this player, the Frank Mahovlich here in front of me, is twenty eight years old. There is no way he looks you like you're talking the days when they had when they didn't play with helmets. Yeah, and they, and they just no teeth and but, like, puck head and, whatever. and they just don't look like. They're like young people do today. No, there's, and I look at Tom Baker a, um, and I go, is that a 41-year-old? Be- because he's just, he's Tom Baker. And to us, or, he's like always just older immortal. than us. Because yeah. Or one thing, I, one thing I saw the other day, and I guess it's it's now been the case for a couple of years. Uh, Will Wheaton is now older than Patrick Stewart was when TNG began. Yeah. Uh, as of recording, this day in history, uh, folks, January 10th. 2022 david tennant crossed the brimley cocoon line he is now older is than wilford brimley was when cocoon came out you know <laughs> and everyone thinks that oh wilford brimley looks ancient in cocoon no nope. he's younger than david tennant now officially yep. as if he was in there's a by the way there's a there's a twitter feed called something like old footballers or old 70s footballers and it's all guys in their 20s who look like 45 yeah, who played a- football in england in the 70s well, I saw a thing earlier today or yesterday, maybe uh, a picture of the guy who played old Indiana Jones in the young indie TV series. Right. Who's younger now than Harrison Ford is, <laughs> but looks older than Weird. what Harrison Ford right. looks like now. Weird. Oh, man. Well, it's like watching David Bradley, who is 20 years older than... Yeah, the William than, Hartnell. Um, yeah, God, I'm getting close to how... Well, when, when, when did William Hartnell take over the role? 55, 57? 55, yeah. 55. I am four years away yep. from where he was when he took over the role. Good yeah, God. Yeah, but the mileage, though, that is some old mileage there. You yeah, know? I don't think I look yeah. like he did. <laughs> That's a very hairy chest. That is. That's, that's Also, you got to remember, these cats went through war, too. That'll stress anybody yeah, out. That's the problem with these costumes here, with these... Really weird wide necklines for. Well, they have a, it's almost like they have a scoop scoop neckline to show off their cleavage. Uh, yeah, for whatever reason. Oh, they're they're here suitness. The glorious time of the seventies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those are bonkers. But if you look like so. Chewbacca and or Bigfoot, be a little that guy is like the only um, hairy chested guy. Mm-hmm. Are these chairs like? Uh, well, these are Brits, I like sort of like blessing, commercially yeah. available. Like, are you are these the chairs of the boardrooms in uh, of the? <laughs> They're probably from nineteen seventies. Yeah. Well, now I want to know who's 19... unauthorized personnel. There's nobody on the ship. Are these two <laughs> <That's a good laughs> who are unauthorized? Point. That's a good what's, point. <laughs> what's beyond there that's that's so unauthorized that like only the captain go or whatever? What it's is the your fascination with my forbidden closet of mystery? For the chairs, exactly. what's the 1975 version of Wish.com? <laughs> Sears Roebuck. Sears Roebuck, yeah. Consumers Distributing, uh, I don't know. Only Amer- uh, Canadians know about Consumers Distributing, as far as I know. Yeah, I think so. And I think it might even be an only Western Canada thing. Because I, I say know. that to name the people, and people know, well, no. now. But even back then, people had no idea what I was talking about. I mean, still, stuff like that still exists, like Argos in the in the UK. There's still like a catalog seller yeah. kind of thing. Oof. Well, oh, I'm sure it exists here, but... Is he going to drink that? that? Oh, is he going to yeah. drink that? Look at that Wolfman action. Oh, my God. He's drinking that. What the hell? Mm-hmm. Holy crap. That's going to be... A young Matt Berry taught us how to laugh. That there... <laughs> that... Whatever he just drank can't be healthy now. I don't I don't no. think whatever he did just now would be allowed by there's health and safety to, but, today. But, we, we, I mean, you have, I, the, you have the smoke stuff, but I don't know if there's any actual, like, anything to drink. Like, I, also, I'd, like, I'd like to point out... Uh, yeah. I'd like to point out that... Uh, it probably pales in comparison to whatever these guys were drinking at the pub before, after, and during, during the production. Mostly <laughs> during. Oh. Shots of turpentine at lunch. Exactly. <laughs> Makes you a man. Come on, drink it. Come drink it, lad. Drink, drink up your drink, turpentine. Drinking, drinking bleach before it was cool to do with COVID. Yeah. Oh, I, I used to drink the turp back in my day. I don't know what that is, but it looks like a blender with a frisbee on it, and I love it. <laughs> it's like a little handheld metal detector. A little bit. <laughs> The frizz bonometer says this guy is definitely not groovy. <laughs> Boop. Oh. It's actually a waffle iron. Oh, that that's the funeral, eh? That's it, eh? Just that out to go. Jeez, yep. even in Star Trek they put them in a <laughs> like, right? They usually said a few words. Oh. Of my friend, I can only say this. Yeah. In all my travels, three episodes. Yeah. I've never seen anyone more human. 
His chili had ah. the most Cuban, as I recall, a Duckman uh, parody of that scene. Ah, yes, yes, I do recall that. Ah, Duckman. It's a murder mystery now. It's turned into Are they terror Freemasons? The Are they space yeah. Freemasons? Is that what that symbol? Means? I, I was going to question that. My uh, uh, actually, you know what it looks like is the. It looks um, like Scarrow's ship. It looks like Scarrow's ship exactly. It does actually. You're right. I'm pretty sure that uh, who designed um, that wasn't Roger Murray Leach. He'd left by then. Um, City of Death. Yeah, City of Death. I don't know. Like even the costume or the. Uh, you would cut yourself on every one of these pieces of equipment. Probably. Because I grew up with lawn darts, Warren. Uh, you know, back yeah, in yeah, my yeah. day, we... Uh, I remember lawn darts. <laughs> yeah. I also remember lawn darts. Sharp remember those, uh, objects that we threw into the grass, and you just had to uh, avoid them, essentially. That was our Remember those, those little toy guns where you could shoot discs at other kids? Yeah. And they were safe because oh, yeah. they were circular? Yeah. Couldn't possibly go in your eye. No. Nope. nope. Uh, Except when the they did. Designer for City of Death is Richard McMahon Smith. That sounds familiar. Obviously, it had nothing to do with this. That's only four years after that. I just love how child safety with toys back in the 70s was. Well, good luck. Yep. It's an interesting gun. Oh, Apprentice Hancock. You only watched one episode of Space 1999. It wasn't quite like this. And honestly, it felt kind of weird. Thinking, when are you going to like, where's the scowl? Where's the scowl, Hancock? <laughs> Let's get going here. I'm ashamed to admit this, but uh, I watched the first episode of Space 1999 and I fell asleep. Oh. <laughs> I know our UK listeners are like, how dare you blasphemous scoundrel, but I just couldn't do it. It's, Martin, it, Martin Lando uh, just didn't turn your crank enough? Nope. It's interesting how, and I mean this with, I, I mean, I'm going to try and sound not like a biased party here when it comes to comparing videotape stuff to film stuff, but it's amazing how much slower that film series feels compared to mm -hmm. stuff this this the sandbaggers like i was expecting the sandbaggers to be slow and it was not in any way and it's on videotape i don't know for some reason the energy of the performances just keeps it going whereas film it's like hey cool well we need to fill a lot of time and uh uh we can't afford to sort of cut in between because that would use more film so we're just going to hang on this shot for also, 12 minutes you're, you you expect it to be that glacial because the most dramatic one hour TV in the seventies yeah, was that glacial. It really was. I don't I tried watching the pilot of the Rockford Files, which is a very well written show, and I couldn't get through it because it's just so slow. It's so weird. Pacing on TV. But but oddly enough, you I also have to change the eighties and switch up with, to like heart heart to heart or women can see yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Okay. Also slow as dirt. Yeah. Even even some of the, the early TNG episodes I feel kind of like really drag a little oh, bit. Oh yeah, they you know? do really or what's Waffle that? On a bit. What's that? Donnelly Rhodes. Um, Danger Bay. Danger Bay. Yeah, yeah. It was only half hour. He episodes. of BSG fame. Yeah. He of soap fame, sir. Yeah, oh, that's true. Yeah, you take it back. You are right. Yeah. He is glorious in soap. Maybe, Which again, I don't want to watch again because I'm going to go. Uh, yeah. If I see it again, it might not be as good as I remember. I, I like. I can't tell if we just think you know because we've watched Doctor Who all our lives so we're just used to it is is it slow but or is it not because that 20 you have to get to that 25 minute cliffhanger you know you got to get to the end of episode one and so I feel like Doctor Who despite you know being oh it's a lot more drawn out and stuff but is it really though I think a, I think they cram a lot in to most episodes some, there's some sometimes I, yeah. I I recently as of like recording just watched uh, the wheel in space episode one which is one of the slowest moving pieces of mm -hmm. television ever made uh, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of instances where you have to introduce the the setup the scenario all the characters and then also Doctor Who and the companion have to get involved in it as well and and that's a lot to do in 25 minutes. Often to the detriment of episodes two and three, because you got to, uh, you know, like, oh, crap, we have to somehow spread this out until we get to the climax. Does it hurt that episode one doesn't exist, maybe? I don't know. For? For Wheel in Space. No, I'd rather watch it. Although it's kind of, it's, it's just robot following Doctor Who and Jamie around a spaceship for 25 minutes. It's amazing how little happens in that. And then you got to set up because Troughton's on holiday for episode two. So we got to find a way to incapacitate him towards the end of episode one, knowing that he's not going to be there in part two. And let me tell you, Troughton not in an episode really does not move along an episode very much. So the first two episodes of Wheel <laughs> in Space are pretty dull. 
I just want to point out how weird the human brain is because I just said the last thing I said was mm-hmm. I really don't want to ruin my imagination about the imaginary thing I watched way back. When. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make any sense at all? No, no, it doesn't. But the human mind will do that. Yep. I waffle iron, keep away. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Graham Weston have to act right there. <laughs> Fashion has come full circle to the point where this looks out of date again. <laughs> Recently out of date. Yeah, <laughs> It's, it's, the, it's oh, the poofy shoulders. This is coming. This is one of the best screen punches in Doctor Who history. Uh, and it's bo- mostly because of the acting, but also because of the, the quick cut. Watch. He cuts on the action. Ready for this? Watch this punch. Okay, that is that is pretty good. Look at that. <clears throat> it feels like he really hits him there. That's really well can, done. You can, all, you can also very obviously see he... Sh- <laughs> It came nowhere close to his face. Yeah, I wonder if that, I wonder if that was just luck of the draw that they got it that good, or if it was they had timed it out like that. Uh, maybe, or maybe that we just watched cut, you know, take five of that sequence as well. Because yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But, but I mean, there good. are instances when you're doing stuff as live here where you just completely luck out and it looks that good. Mm-hmm. And I bet you everyone in the control was like, "Oh my god!" And they keep going, keep going, lads, keep going. Mm-hmm. We don't see do- the doctor in his scarf for very much of this. Uh... Well, then it's not canon. No, it's not. It's a rare scarfless uh, episode of Doctor. Oh, <laughs> the doctor is scarfless. Repeat, scarfless. It's a good fall there by Tom. <laughs> he is really prenticing this up. This is. Uh... <laughs> this is don't, this. Don't, don't use his name as a verb. Full Hancock. He is going full Hancock in this one. This is uh, go back to using his name as a verb. Full Hancock sounds full, dirty. Full Hancock. Full Prentice. Full Prentice. For a second there, I thought he was drinking out of a smoke detector. <laughs> <laughs> That's on fire. Oh no, my thermos of blood. Oh, what do I do? Oh, even the liquids. Bre- what is that? What is that? That's not even very, tea very, or... very, very dark red. Almost it's brown. a bloody mary yeah. this is a cool effect still that is creepy so if you that look, is so rad. if you look around the eyes like the jagged kind of yeah like cut out i, around I the... think they're on his eyelids yeah, like, i think they're on his eyelids say, like he's probably yeah. got like green or whatever color cardboard yeah. on his I, eyes there, it's maybe. odd how how this works better in 1975 stuff painted on his eyelids uh compared to cassia in keeper of chalk and five years later mm-hmm. Where it looks pretty bad. Damn, it looks good though. I gotta say, it looks. This great. looks better than it does five years later. Is what I mean to say. Yeah. You know. I've just noticed that there's an extra in the back there, um, and that guy too. There's two extras. I don't know if they looks die. Like a young Stephen Moffat. Yeah. I, He's unauthorized. He cannot go into that area on the bridge. It's just like pretty much everyone's dead at this point. Um, who's gonna die? In terms of, I don't know. I think Michael Wishel's character is still around, but. Uh, I like that. I like that he, uh, Salomar, forces Vashinsky to be the one who actually do this. He doesn't do it himself. It's a good character moment there. As we have the cliffhanger for part three of Planet of Evil, a.k.a. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a.k.a. Forbidden Planet, the store, not the classic uh, 1955 movie. <laughs> Morelli. Captain Morelli's mandolin. Michael Wisher. That's uh, what it's named after. Yeah. After this. There it is. Special sound. Peter Hall. I never may noticed be incorrect. that. incorrect. Never, Warren. Never. I never watched that movie, but Stan Spiel. I always wonder what Mac Adams, M A C Adams. I wonder. I always wonder what that stood for. <laughs> well, he's 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 Adams' crazier brother, Mac Adams. Mac Adams, <laughs> Mac Adams. That's a Black Adder reference, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. Well done, well done indeed. All right. Uh, well, that's it. Uh, we'll wrap this up. Part four of Planet of Evil uh, in our next classic series commentary here on Ready for Scar. Do join us, won't you? Until then. I am Stephen in Edmonton. We're in Vancouver. And Chris in Edmonton. So long for now. You've been listening to Radio Free Scaro. Find us online at RadioFreeScaro.com. Follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Radio Free Scaro. Subscribe to us on iTunes and donate to the show 
patreon.com forward slash Radio Free Scarrow. Thank you.